In this conversation, I speak with Vince Horn, the founder of Buddhist Geeks. I started listening to Buddhist Geeks when I was in college in the 2000s, and it was a huge inspiration on my practice. And I've been connecting with Vince on Twitter and in other places over the last few years. And recently, he reached out to me to offer to discuss transparent generosity with me, which is a financial model that they've been developing and using at Buddhist Geeks. And so I wanted to talk to him on this podcast about that. And we also talked about a few other affordances that they've been building into the nonprofit structure at Buddhist Geeks, which is a big interest of mine since I do nonprofit work. Um, but we also branched out into a lot of other topics about contemporary cultural culture and spiritual practice and uh, the world at large right now. And it was a really delightful conversation for me, and I hope you'll enjoy it as well. Hi, Vince. Thanks so much for joining me today. Hey, Tashin. Good to see you again. Uh, it's a really nice opportunity to have a chance to talk. I've, I've been uh, a fan of Buddhist Geeks for such a long time now, and uh, it's been a real delight to connect over the years in different ways on Twitter and so on. And um, kind of the impetus so people know recently for this conversation was recently you offered to talk to me about uh, transparent generosity models. You've been doing a lot of experimentation at Buddhist Geeks with different forms of structuring organizations and nonprofit work, which is something I'm fascinated with. So that's what I'm really hoping to steer towards. But um, so, so we'll get plenty of time to talk about that. But I'd also like to get the bigger picture for folks of like why that work is so important to you. Um, so maybe we could start just by talking about your story and your background and kind of where you're coming from with your life and with meditation and with Buddhist geeks, kind of tell me whatever you'd like to about uh, your story and, and your life. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll try to give the thumbnail sketch of how I got to where I am today. Um, uh, so I'm 38 now, almost 38. And I started doing a formal practice uh, when I was 19. So just about 20 years ago, actually, when I was 13, I started and then stopped for a little while and came back at 19 and been practicing since. And um, I was a computer engineering student at uh, North Carolina State University at the time when I started to catch the enlightenment bug and start to really kind of wonder like, what's true? What's really true? And who am I? And like these kind of deep existential questions, which can arise, I think, often for people at that age. But then uh, I, I think too, when they arise, it's like, well, I just got to get to class. I've got to finish my midterms. Like there's all these things that we're doing. And for some reason, the seeking for me was so strong and so intense and so important that it really overshadowed everything else that I was doing. And I dropped out of the computer engineering department. I went into philosophy where I thought oh, maybe I could find some answers. Didn't find that much in the Western philosophy department at NC State. Um, and then found my way into a student group um, called the Self-Knowledge Symposium, which was originally inspired by the work of this West Virginian farmer, the self-enlightened guru of, of the like 40s and 50s named Richard Rose. Strange, enigma enigmatic character. But his, some of his students were really interesting folks. So they started this student group, David Gold and Augie Turek. And they were entrepreneurs um, as well as practitioners. And so I think from the very beginning, for me, those two threads were kind of intertwined. And uh, although in the beginning, I was more of a hardcore meditator, I, I eventually dropped out entirely just to meditate full time. I was waiting tables and, and going on retreats. And then eventually my wife, uh, my current wife, then girlfriend, uh, she said, hey, honey, you know, you could actually go get a degree at this place called Naropa University and meditate and finish your degree. <laughs> so she very, very wisely like steered me in that direction. And uh, we moved to Boulder, Colorado when Naropa is, is based. And uh, at Naropa, I, I found um, a couple communities. One was the Buddhist uh, Shambhala community uh, there at Naropa, which was founded by a Tibetan teacher named Chegyam Trungpa. Uh, and there's this whole community around his work that was still present very much in that community. And then I also found uh, and was a, was a passionate kind of um, student of Ken Wilbers, who is an integral philosopher. I'd been reading his work before we moved out there and uh, very fortunately found a job at his integral institute, uh, a nonprofit that he was running at the time in 2004 through six. Um, and so I was working part-time there, going to school, meditating a lot. And that for me was kind of like 
the place where Buddhist Geeks was born because I was so interested in all of the the media stuff that we were doing with Integral Institute, in particular through this website called Integral Naked, which was one of the first media, like pay for service media sites that I'd ever seen. And this was early 2004, before before Facebook, before Twitter. Um, you know, Ken was really pushing a lot of edges and both in his philosophical work, but also in the, in the way that he executed this, um, this project. And so I learned a lot in, in that environment, you know, making $5 an hour uh, doing web work. Um, but I learned a tremendous amount and I took that and I really, I wanted to continue this exploration of what is integral. You know, this was, this was his whole, the thrust of his work. You know, how do you bring together Essentially, how do you bring together what's true from all the different strands of human knowledge uh, and have a comprehensive view of what's going on? Um, and so I was really curious about that and really passionate about my Buddhist practice. I, so I wanted to explore that question in the context of Buddhism without having to use those terms because they're so technical and philosophical and they turn a lot of people off. So I was like, I want to explore what this means, what this is, but without using the language. So just use the use the language that people are familiar with in Buddhism. So that was the the start of the Buddhist Geeks project, and it started really as a podcast in 2007. We launched January 1st, 2007. So it was early in podcasting days, and we just caught uh, my friend Ryan Olkey and I at the time. We caught this wave. You know, I think we we were doing something that was new at a time where the medium was new. And we just, you know, even though we were totally inexperienced and, you know, wet behind the ears, uh, we just caught this kind of caught this wave and the podcast exploded in popularity and became kind of one of the most popular Buddhist podcasts. Um, and so more or less that became like my full-time hobby project. And then it, in 2010, a few years later, I figured out how to make it a full-time um, work and I um, made that transition from working for other people and doing cool work, but still not exactly the work I wanted to do to um, running this small, at the time, for-profit um, that was mostly supported by the generosity of people listening to the podcast. And we kind of went from there and did a bunch of other stuff, which I don't know if it's important for the context of this conversation, but um, mm. eventually we became a nonprofit, and, and that was an interesting transition. And maybe more more to the point of, um, to the point of what what you want to talk about. But uh, yeah, that's a brief history. More or less. Yeah, tell me about that. Like, what were the different iterations of Buddhist Geeks, both in terms of like what you're doing or what you're aiming for, and then also the kind of uh, configurations of it, making that move from for profit to non profit. Yeah, sure. So, so 2007 to 2010, it was really a hobby project, a passion project. Um, there was very little money uh, that was running through the organization. We we started as an LLC um, simply because that was the easiest way for us to like buy a microphone and <laughs> do do it as a business. <laughs> we, we knew nothing about nonprofits, uh, and we we really were truly ignorant about um, the structure of business in a lot of ways. So um, that's how it started. And you know when you when you form a organization. It's actually really important how it's formed. <laughs> it turns out <laughs> I later learned that. Um, yeah. And in 2010, it just didn't make sense to me at the time to try to reincorporate or change the name of the thing. It just was much easier to continue along those lines of being a for-profit. But but very much we did it in a way, uh, we, we, we raised funds in a way that was very much like a nonprofit. We started this micro patronage drive where people were giving five, 10, 15, $20 a month. And we were giving kind of like Patreon now, we were giving like little little incentives at, at these different levels. And we, we uh, basically, I was able to quit my job and take a go at working on the project full time uh, with the income that we brought in from this micro patronage drive in 2010. I was working at the time at Sounds True, which is a spiritual media uh, publishing company. And um, I remember talking to Tammy Simon, who's the founder of Sounds True. And I was telling her, you know, I'm going to be leaving. And I sort of expected she'd be a little frustrated or upset. You know, when some, you, leave, you lose someone on your team that's valuable. Usually people get whatever. And, and it was totally the opposite reaction. She jumped up and gave me a high five. And she's like, yay, good for you. And she just saw my entrepreneurial spirit. You know, she was the same way. And so it was like, 
she was genuinely happy for me. It was total mm. empathetic joy. Mm. So and, sweet. Um, yeah, that was really sweet. So it was a good start to, to the company. And then from 2010 to about 2014, that was our sort of for-profit uh, kind of growth period, I would say. We were doing a bunch of new projects, most notably a, uh, an annual conference that ended up attracting maybe 1,200 people total over the course of the four years we ran it. And we, we because of that conference, we suddenly got on the on the larger um, media radar, and we had you know a bunch of articles came out from like L.A. Times, The Guardian, Wired magazine. So suddenly, Buddhist Geeks was this big deal because of this particular moment, and because we actually met in person, it was a real thing. Suddenly, mm-hmm. um, so that 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 sort of like put me into this weird category of like my Buddhist micro celebrity. Uh, and my ego also just <laughs> blew up <laughs> in proportion. Um, <laughs> and, and so I was very much in this kind of mindset of like, I'm this like, you know, Buddhist for profit, like CEO, and I'm going to like change the world. And, you know, uh, all these things that, uh, the article said I was doing. <laughs> uh, uh-huh. and, and so I bought, I bought my own, I bought the hype <laughs> around myself <laughs> you know? and, um, and more or less, we, we built a small team. Uh, Daniel Thorson joined our team, who you know, who you um, lived with at the Monastic Academy. Um, he was an awesome team member. We had, I, I think it, at the peak, we maybe had four full-time employees and a number of volunteers, and uh, freelancers working on the project. And we raised money. We, uh, we raised a, a decent amount, hundreds of thousands in um you know, in uh, investment capital, we had some great investors and advisors who I really appreciate. You know, still to this day, um, because mm-hmm. they they understood what we were trying to do. I think, and they were totally cool. Uh, virtually all of them were totally cool with us, realizing that this wasn't the right form for us to be in. And and in 2014 or 15, Buddhist Geeks kind of like collapsed, um, and I moved back home from Colorado to where I grew up in North Carolina. I crashed into my grandparents. Uh, they have a, a guest home, which I'm really grateful for and had a place to land and not have to pay rent for a couple months and just kind of like recovered from the ego explosion that was the last <laughs> few years and the failure that was the for-profit model for us. Um, we, were, uh, we, we weren't able to grow in the way we wanted and it didn't really work it just didn't really fit um so we reincorporated uh, as a not well we didn't reincorporate we had a group that incorporated a nonprofit, and then we transferred the assets of buddhist geeks to that nonprofit, and essentially were reborn in a 501c3 educational nonprofit form um, but we didn't really do much with that in fact i kind of did another i had another little a uh, spasm of trying to do the for-profit meditation thing with another a new mm. project called Meditate.io, and I, I spent a couple of years, in a sense, trying to do what we had, what had already failed with the first iteration of Buddhist Keys. Mm-hmm. Um, and then at that point, I think the capitalist drive in me, and like the drive to do the successful business uh, and be successful in those terms, like I just ran out, and I felt like I just couldn't get behind my own at that time I was teaching also through, through meditate IO and I couldn't get behind my own teaching. Like I didn't feel right charging people a hundred dollars an hour for one-on-one sessions. And especially when they were like in a country like Turkey and their, you know, their, uh, their money was suddenly inflated and they couldn't afford to talk to me Mm. when they needed support the most. And it just, all, everything about the for-profit model, the capitalist pay-for-service model just just didn't work anymore for me. And I, I realized like I need to like let this go and come at it from a new, uh, from a new place. And so Buddhist Geeks restarted. So this is what, I don't know, fourth iteration at this point now um, in um, 2017. And I came back with a series on Buddhism and psychedelics, meditating on psychedelics. And that ended up being really popular. And then I started teaching again through, through the through the platform very simply at first. And I and I during that time was experimenting with a new model because we were 501c3, we could do donations. But I had found in the past that just pure donation-based teaching just didn't work. 
um, like people didn't value my time. Um, they would end up giving me nothing or very little. And I wasn't able to make a living off of pure, what in the Buddhist tradition is called dana, generosity, a pure mm-hmm. dana model. So I had been inspired by a couple things. One, the suggested donation model that I'd seen at a lot of local insight meditation centers where you come in and there's a suggested donation, $10 for the night. And I, I talked to one of my mentors and a therapist that I worked with for a while, David Chernikoff. And he said, this really works. The suggested donation is great. Like we, we make a lot more money when we put a suggested price there, even though it's, you don't have to give anything it's suggested. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then I also saw that, uh, the social media company called buffer Buffer buffer.com, uh, that allows you to kind of schedule social media posts that they had this thing called transparent pricing where they really broke down how like the money that you were spending the $10 a month on the service, like how it was, where it went and how it was being used so that you could kind of understand their pricing structure. And they were a for profit. So it was kind of interesting. And at some point the two kind of came together in my mind and I thought, Oh, well, maybe there's a way to do this suggested donation thing, but to include the sort of transparency of like, how much are people giving? And, you know, um, what's the average amount that people give for this, say, 10 week course or this one on one session or whatever, this retreat. Um, and we ended up, I ended up experimenting with that with these small cohorts of, you know, these courses that I was running. And uh, tweaked it for a little while and then just found it was working really, really well once I got the model down and people were being really generous and I was able to make a living off of this transparent generosity model. And I, my heart was in it. That was the big thing. I was like behind myself again, you know, like, oh yeah, like I believe in what I'm doing now. And it feels in, in alignment with the spirit of the lineage that I've trained in and received, you know, so much generosity from um, and so it just felt, yeah, like a heart alignment. And since then we've, um, we've been growing our, our, our organization, our community, our platform. We've trained a number of teachers now who are also teaching using that same generosity model. And it's, it's continuing to work really, really well. Um, and so I'm really quite happy with it. In fact, mm-hmm. for my one-on-one time, I uh, just looked up the stats for last month. And so far this year, I, I have a suggested donation amount of $108 a month, which is a sort of Tibetan Buddhist <laughs> numerology thing. Uh, it's an auspicious <laughs> number. And in fact, uh, people have been giving me $155 an wow. hour um, wow. of my time. So it's it's actually worked far better than I would have expected. I'm making more money um, doing it through generosity than I would uh, setting the price. Um, Mm -hmm. and I'm way, I'm way happier, uh, and I'm Mm -hmm. able to work with people across the spectrum financially in different countries where the exchange rates are much lower in compact in contrast to the dollar. And it just feels good. Um, so I'm really happy with it so far. And, Mm -hmm. uh, I I hope, I hope to take that model further and to, you know, I'd, I'd love to see it built into an actual platform, like a formal platform that other people could use. Because I think this whole idea of just combining generosity with transparency, it's just, you know, it's an idea that is, it's, it's, it's really perfect for the internet age and for the time we're in. And mm-hmm. I'd love to see it uh, more widely adopted in part because it's, it's almost like it gives people a little bridge to the, to the whole generosity spirit in Buddhism, which is unconditional. It's like mm-hmm. whatever you want to give. Um, I think it, it gives people a way with their so conditioned to the capitalist orientation of seeing services or goods tied to a particular numerical value it gives them a way to translate in into the generosity paradigm it's like a it's like a gateway drug you know um Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. so i think i think it's got potential on a larger you know cultural basis to maybe help kind of introduce people to generosity to see what that's about a different a different economic model I'd love to ask you about the the practical parts of that, but like I want to before we do that, I'd love to just dive in. You, you touched on this, but I'd love to hear more about um, 
what you were finding wasn't working about a for-profit model for the project and its goals and its values, and then what a nonprofit model has been uh, offering that the for-profit model wasn't. What you know, you say it feels better, and I, I totally relate to that. And you were talking about it just wasn't working, and you weren't able to offer your services and in the ways that you'd want to, and so on. But can you just speak more to that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think there's a few there's a few threads um, for me here. One is the just the historical dimension of Buddhism and how its origins really were in India, Nepal. It, it arose as a kind of rebellion against the current caste system. It was like a different, a different approach. And, um, and so the Buddhist monks lived like a lot of other ascetics um, in India at the time. They lived off of, the generosity of the people who are willing to support them. We thought there was some value in what they're doing. And I know you, you know a lot about this, uh, having been a monastic yourself. Um, and so there's something about the spirit of that, of, of being able to pursue the spiritual path and the spiritual life because of the generosity of other people supporting you. That is just like at the heart of, of the tradition. And I remember being the recipient of that generosity when I went to places like the Insight Meditation Society to Spirit Rock, and they had all these incredible scholarships uh, for young people, for people that were, you know, in their teens or twenties, and I took huge advantage. I mean, I spent months on retreat, you know, for like very little money, um, because because they offered this, because the the teachers that I'd worked with, Jack Cornfield, Joseph Goldstein, Sharon Salzberg, all these teachers, they 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 took what they'd learned in the monasteries of Burma and Thailand and India, and they brought that spirit of generosity uh, and translated that across into, you know, Western culture in the seventies and eighties. And for me, it was, you know, I took a huge advantage of it and it felt weird not, you know, continuing that, like not mm -hmm. being an open through line for that spirit of generosity that went, that went so far back and was animating this tradition, which I'd learned so much from. Um, so I think that, that is like one of the really big reasons just on a kind of deep heart level connection with this tradition and wanting to bring forth what's best about it, what I'd found best about it. Um, and then I think the other part was just seeing my, you know, seeing my own egoic inflation, you know, and my mm -hmm. own self-worth and value being tied to success in financial terms, which is something that I like I and most Americans, I think, grew up uh, with that conditioning, you know, being, being strong part of, of uh, what we see around us, certainly in media, for my family as well. My grandfather's an entrepreneur. My mom was an entrepreneur. Like I, I'd seen that as a, as a measure of worth, you know, how well you do financially. So I wanted to be worthy, you know, more or less. And I think as I saw, started to see through that and see the pain in that, um, you know, I, I could tell that it, 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 it was a weird pursuit to bring into this domain and understandable, but, um, but, but not, not, not really in alignment. So that was like on a personal level, just kind mm -hmm. of deconditioning myself. And, and, and then, and I also received a lot of critiques, um, for how we were approaching, uh, business and in the Buddhist space. And, um, you know, it was the same kind of critiques that got leveled at Silicon Valley. Um, and I think rightly so, uh, of a certain kind of, of a mentality of sort of assimilating everything into this capitalist world system mm -hmm. and, um, and not really thinking about the, the downstream effects of that. And, uh, as I saw those critiques, some of them were really kind and cool and some of them were really garish and terrible, but I let in the parts that felt true over time and realized that they were accurate, you know, and there was something, something fundamentally that needed to be questioned about the very world system that we're operating in and all of the, you know, the ways in which that world system has brought us to the, to the brink of ecological collapse, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's so hyper unequal in terms of how wealth is, um, is distributed and how that it continues to, to grow that inequality and all these really social issues. And I, I realized, oh yeah, I'm contributing 
to this larger platform that is leading to all of these really terrible outcomes. And um, from an ethical standpoint, I just didn't feel like I could continue to do that, even though it's hard to do some things without doing a capitalist model. Like it really truly is um, so, so certain kinds of work at scale. And I, so I'm not, I'm not saying like no one should do capitalism or that it isn't the appropriate, um, isn't the appropriate vehicle for certain kinds of projects. Like I don't see how Tesla, for instance, could, could operate, how we could get, you know, large scale renewable uh, energy across the world quickly without it being capitalist at this point, because that is the world system. That is the platform, the general platform we're operating on. Um, but, you know, that's not what I'm doing. You know, the Buddhist geeks is not trying to scale renewable energy to the whole world <laughs> and doesn't need a ton of capital. So uh, it's different. And um, yeah, I think those are some of the threads, you know, when I look at what, what wasn't working about the for-profit uh, model, um, it just didn't, didn't make sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so you kind of discovered this transparent generosity model from a few different sources of, you know, Donna historically, and yes. seeing that that was how you, your own practice was supported and that you wanted to offer that forward. And then also this model that you saw from Buffer of like disclosing how things were spent and what the metrics were and so on. And yeah. um, could you just talk about the like uh, nuts and bolts of what implementing transparent generosity for Buddhist geeks has actually looked like, like what exactly did you do to implement it? Yeah. So, um, I went and found a, uh, a platform, a donation platform where people could manage their own donations. Uh, we ended up with uh, kindful.com and, um, and then essentially for each course or each campaign that we're running, essentially any, anything that we offered, whether it's a course or a retreat or, one-on-one -on -one sessions would have a, a, a sort of a campaign that existed just for that. And uh, what we did is we created, uh, when we ran it for the first time, we would sort of offer a suggested donation amount and make that clear when people uh, signed up to donate. Um, and, and the way it would work practically is someone would see the course or whatever, and instead of paying and then getting into the, into the thing, they would just choose to get in and then they would get information about how to make a donation should they choose to. And we would just follow up a few times with them sending emails saying, hey, this is how we sustain this economically. Um, this is the suggested amount, so forth. And then after I ran a couple courses, um, then I had data. You know, I could say, okay, with this particular model, when we have 12 people in a group, and we do for 10 weeks and we meet for 90 minutes a week. Um, this is the amount that people gave on average. Um, this is the range of giving. And I just kind of broke it down mathematically to give people some information. And the next time we ran the same course, then we'd share all of that data and give people a little bit more information about um, previous giving. And in some ways, uh, that's more or less how it works. Um, pretty straightforward and most of the gen most of the transparency for us so far has been on the uh it's been on the giving side we're still very much working on figuring out how to make this elegant on the budgeting side like this is where all the money goes and uh, but of course we do like a, an annual report um like most nonprofits with all the transparency around this but i'd like to have a more real-time uh, mm -hmm. solution for that but i just haven't been able to find a software solution that does that uh, mm -hmm. which again i think there's just, there's an opportunity for that but um, yeah, so we're very much still in the implementation phase uh, of this. Uh, and then we take the data and we, we also share it openly on our, uh, we call it our meta site, M-E-T-A, which is at meta.buddhistgeeks.org. So you can go back and see all of the previous data from all of the previous retreats and uh, trainings, courses, one-on-one -on -one stuff. It's all, it's all there for people to see so that if they want to have any sense of, of that information, they can, they can get it. Um, the other part of this that I didn't mention is that our teachers also practice transparent generosity. Mm. So as a teacher, uh, all of the money goes to the teachers uh, from, from, for virtually all of our programming. And then the teachers have a choice to then give back to the organization to support the administrative overhead of putting on these things. Uh, and so we basically invite our teachers to share a certain percentage if they want. Uh, they could share zero percent they could share 100 percent. it's up to them 
Uh, and then that's uh, essentially how the organization is supported from the generosity of mm -hmm. the teachers. Uh, and, and so it's generosity of the people doing the programs, the generosity of the teachers makes the organization run. And then what ends up happening is we get some people who have means who end up giving larger donations that really helps run the organization. And um, that's surprised me the most, actually, is that we've received way more support in terms of donation money um, using this model than we ever had in the past. Um, and it's really enabled, I think, the organization to continue to, to grow. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like there's there's a lot of different components of this. Really, uh, there's there's like uh, like an analytics portion where you're kind of analyzing the data that you have. Yeah, and a lot then of spreadsheets, like, tracking things like that. Yeah, yeah, and then there's like a, um, a like a technological part where through Kindful people can choose how much they want to give, and then there's like mm -hmm. an informational or educational side yes. where you're telling people, informing them what the model is and what the numbers are oh. that you found. Yeah, and then yep. um, publishing it as well to the web just for anyone to see, and then all of yeah. that supports um, everyone in being able to practice generosity and support the larger mission. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and what I what I was surprised by too is that in a way this model is great for experimenting with new with new um, offerings with new um, solutions because you get this instant financial feedback that at least becomes part of how you how you can kind of evaluate how well something worked. It's not the only measure, mm -hmm. of course, but mm -hmm. it really kind of helps um, inform. Uh, instead of telling people, okay, here's the price, you know, and then and then you, you offer this thing and then you sort, sort of have to do this, um, you know, this process of trying to figure out later, like, what was the price too high? Was it too low? How do we figure out the right price? It's like, no, you just let people tell you what, what they felt, like, what, what the value was for them. And mm -hmm. that's amazing feedback in terms of what you're offering, in addition to other forms of feedback where people actually give direct feedback and, and whatnot. But um, that surprised me. It, it sped up the process, I feel like, of innovation on a, on a product level, you know, if you mm -hmm. want to look at it from a sort of a business perspective. Hmm. Yeah, that makes so, a lot of sense sort of an interesting advantage to working in a for-profit space where you uh -huh. have to do all that, try to do all that up front. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Right. Because people can choose how much to give and then you can find patterns in that. Yeah. Yeah. You'd be like, oh, wow, that really worked. Like it really worked to offer it in this way or this content was like people really responded to this, um, mm -hmm. but just not so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And why do you think, I, I can guess, but why would you, you said that one of the things that surprised you most was that people end up giving a lot more. And why, why do you think that is? I think they start to get the practice of generosity. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They start to see like, Oh yeah, this me this model means that even if someone doesn't give anything, they can still have access to, um, to good instruction, to support. Um, they can do that from wherever they are. So it opens, it opens, beyond the sort of western elite that often um that often i'd say a lot of for-profit like mindfulness projects will cater to or even some western buddhist projects will cater to especially because we're we've always done this virtually we're we're 100 virtual company and so um i think people see that they get it and they want to support that um and they you know, they've seen the real value in their own lives, participating in, in it, and thus they want to see it succeed. You know, mm -hmm. I think that's, mm -hmm. that's more or less it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Huh. And thank gosh for Bitcoin, because with some of our geeky people have like invested in things like Bitcoin. And I think that they've taken the, the benefits of that and given some of it to us. Yeah, right, right. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting point because um, hmm. I feel like transparent generosity, from what I can tell, is like one of several ways that you are really innovating with Buddhist Geeks, that the organization is innovating. And uh, maybe you can tell me about a few of the other things that you've been kind of trying to put into the, the DNA of the organization. Like I know there's holacracy and then also um, you've been writing about something called like open source Dharma. And I, I would love to hear more about how those and any other similar kind of uh, 
organization level experiments or structures fit into this bigger mission? Yeah, and 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 I think the bigger mission here for me, the, the, the reason so much of our focus has been trying to innovate on this organizational or the structural level is because, again, this goes back to my experience with transparent generosity, the teaching as a teacher, the teaching isn't just like the words that come out of my mouth or my time or what I know from meditation. Like the teaching is how the teaching is packaged. It's how it's bundled. It's how it's sold or offered in this case. And um, it's how things are run on the back end. How like how does this person suddenly show up in front of you in Zoom and is and you're doing like these sessions with, you know what is, what what's what's behind, what's the wizard behind the curtain of this thing? And um, I think so often, yeah, those things are sort of seen as being separate, separate or separable. It's like we have the administration over here, and then we have the teaching side over here. Like academic universities are structured that way. And um, unfortunately, that seem, seems to be a big reason that they've seen such a, a degradation in the quality and the power of their teaching over the years, because the sort of administrative side sort of takes over the mission. And it's like, well, the mission is to enroll students. The mission is to bring in more money. The mission is to grow our endowment. And it's like, no, that's not the mission. The mission is to help people learn. And, you know, in our case, we're really wanting to help people learn how to adapt these ancient practices into contemporary times. Um, and so, you know, part of that adaptation is the structure or the organizational form that the, I'll use the term Dharma, that the Dharma takes. Um, our purpose at Buddhist Geeks is evolving Dharma. And so it's not just evolving like the, the style of teaching, which we do that too, or the words that we use or the metaphors, but it's evolving the, the very form that, 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 that the, that the teaching takes, you know, um, and so for me, transparent generosity, holacracy, open source dharma, they're all part of our attempt. Um, and it's just one small attempt, you know, um, and I'm not saying this will work or that's the best model. It's just, it's what we're working on now. Um, it's our attempt to do that, to, to, to evolve dharma in the structural and systemic level, as well as in the cultural and the personal and interpersonal level. It's like, uh, it's a it's an integral approach. Going back to my mentor Ken Wilber, you know, it's like a, a, at every level, this evolve, this Dharma has to evolve. So so yeah, so that's that's the bigger picture. And then I'll talk about holacracy first because that's something I got exposed to when I was working for Ken Wilber back in two thousand five and six. And holacracy was developed by a software engineer named uh, Brian Robertson. And Brian was very influenced by a number of things, but, but one of them was Ken Wilber's integral theory. He was influenced by sociocracy and um, someone's work called requisite organizations. There's a bunch of things that influenced him, but he basically said, you know, there's got to be a better way of doing this whole like organizational thing, you know, where, where we're getting together and practicing. And, and in, in, in essence, my understanding of holacracy is that it's, it's, it's a way of organizing that allows autonomy to take um, to take precedence that allows people who are already capable of autonomous functioning, like they already can self-manage themselves. Uh, it creates an environment where those kind of people can thrive. And um, it, it does that in a number of ways. But when I was exposed to that system originally, uh, while I was working at Integral Institute, and they tried to kind of adopt a little bit of it, they didn't do a wholesale adoption because Ken would have had to kind of give over his authority and distribute it into the holacracy. And I don't think he was quite ready to do that. Um, uh, it's hard for the founder you know, to let go. <laughs> and as I've, I may have found that as well. Um, but I, I just fell in love with the, with the ideas. Uh, and we ended up adopting it with Buddhist Geeks from the very beginning in 2007, we were using holacracy. We, in fact, we hired um, Brian and um, uh, to come out and do a three day, uh, implementation workshop with uh, with our with our company at the time the Boost Geeks was part of, and um, and yeah it um, it just kind of stuck with us. That was actually before Holacracy reached their 1.0 version. Now we're in 5.0, um, hmm. and it became quite popular too. Like Zapier adopted it, Harvard Business Review ended up doing all kinds of articles about it. The David Allen Company, the guy that started the GTD productivity method, adopted it. And he th he thought it was the jam. It was a perfect mm -hmm. complement to his system. 
And I wasn't surprised by any of that because I, I knew it was awesome. But mm -hmm. um, it was just kind of validation for me that there's something there. And so so that's a system that we use um, for 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 really how we operate as a company. It's our it's our organizational operating system. And it defines roles and accountabilities. It gives us ways to process tensions that arise in the organization without having to kind of go to the normal like um, kind of ways that people process those tensions, which is usually get really political and really nasty and go to the person who's got the most power and they'll just like, you know, kind of decree from on high, like how things have to be. Um, and so there's a, it's a, to me, it's a more wise and intelligent mean way of taking conflicts and opportunities and, and letting those conflicts and opportunities help evolve the very structure of the organization, the policies, the roles, the accountabilities of the organization itself. Again, it's an evolutionary system. It's one that sees tension as an opportunity to doubt. Um, I think that's consistent with all the things that we do. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's kind of holacracy. There's a lot more I, on holacracy for those that are interested. I, I had Brian Robertson on our podcast 2010 or so to talk about it. And uh, yeah, it's a really interesting system for those people that are, I think, geeky who want to take on something that's complex. Um, it's a big shift from normal operating. So it does take a lot of investment. And you have to have people uh, who are in the leadership positions of the organization really adopt it, um, in my experience. Otherwise, it's, you, you get these little kind of silos of people trying to practice this thing. And it doesn't, doesn't usually work that way, in my experience. Um, so it's got issues, but um, we're still going with it, we're going strong. Um, and then open source Dharma, uh, that's, a, that's a relatively recent project. And um, for a while now, we have been offering all of the content that we, that we do, um, the podcast, um, any recordings from our courses or retreats, any artifacts really that come out of Buddhist Speaks that we offer back to the world. Um, we offer them using a specific uh, uh, licensing, which is called Creative Commons, that really arose as part of the internet, you know, a, a new way of trying to identify the different ways that information can be shared um, when, when there's so much of it and it's so freely available. And there's a certain class of this Creative Commons um, licensing that is considered kind of the most open right below public domain, like very just like it's free. Anyone can use it for any purpose. And, uh, and this is called a free cultural work. So if a free cultural work in the creative Commons system means that anyone can take the content that you license this way. They can uh, use it for any purpose they want, even including making money from it commercially. Um, they can remix it. They can adapt it. Uh, and the only stipulations are either that it's by attribution, meaning that you have to attribute where it comes from originally, which makes a lot of sense to me, again, being in a tradition that, that sort of considers lineage important, like we're just honoring mm -hmm. and respecting, like, where does this come from? Like, I didn't just make mm -hmm. this shit up. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and then the other thing is you can stipulate, though we don't do this currently, you can stipulate that people who do change it or adapt it have to, have to continue to license it in the same way. Um, to mm -hmm. use the same kind of licensing, which is called share alike. Um, and so, yeah, we offer everything we do through this, um, this free cultural work licensing, Creative Commons by Attribution International 4.0 license. Um, and the, the reason for that, and this is the reason for the open source Dharma project, is that in the tech world, open source has won. Open source is the dominant model. And, and some people don't realize that, but Microsoft now has opened up most of their code base is open source. Um, mm -hmm. Most tech companies discovered that if a lot of the stuff that they're building off of is being contributed to by a large community of people, uh, that, that that's going to actually outpace proprietary development when you have just your team who's trying to work on this thing in a silo and then develop it, it's like, no, actually, if you get everyone in the world who's interested in building this thing and is contributing to it, including multiple companies even or individuals, that we can build something that's much better because there is this thing called permissionless innovation where you don't have to go do a training, you don't have to go get certified, you don't have to go get permission to access someone's like code or someone's teachings before you can use it. 
um, you actually can just do it because that's how it's licensed. And because of that, there it, it increases the rate and speed at which innovation can occur. And that's the that's the actual that's the actual spirit of open source Dharma. We have a site called opensourcedharma.info where we just kind of lay out this protocol and invite other communities and teachers if they want to release their content as a free cultural work, they can be part of this larger movement. And I and we can identify who's doing this so that we can see this large, we can build this larger collection of resources and tools and techniques and guided meditations and in our case, social meditations that people that anyone could use and adapt so that we can speed up the, the, the we can increase the rate of innovation happening in the Dharma meditation and mindfulness space. And I think that's, you know, it's an ethical thing is what it is. Uh, it's like, hey, we need to do this and do this quick because these technology, psychotechnologies and these teachings are really valuable right now. Like they're really needed. And so uh, why would we be hiding them behind a paywall if they're that needed? You know, why, mm -hmm. why would we be doing anything other than trying to get them out there as quickly as possible to get them, again, this is evolution, to get them recombined with other methods and techniques as rapidly as possible so that they can they can, they can serve whatever niches in this larger ecology of human human experience on the planet Earth that 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 they're needed in. Um, and so me, to me, there was a disconnect between the old guard proprietary Dharma and meditation teaching models and the spirit of these teachings and what they're about. And to, and to be fair to to the old guard, like I don't think they're all aware of open source and all these things. So. So it's not like I'm mad at them exactly. I mean, I do get frustrated, but it's also that like this is the this is the call for the next generation, the millennials, you know, to get oh like this is how Dharma evolves in this generation. We make it open source, you know, mm -hmm. make it freely available, freely accessible, and freely remixable, so that it can spread wide, far, can adapt, can evolve, can become part of the larger mix of what's happening. So yeah, that's open source Dharma. Mm. What are the uh... What are the different kind of offerings that Buddhist Geeks has currently that you're contributing through this uh, new medium of open source Dharma? You, you talked a little bit about social meditation, and I'd be curious to hear more about that and any other offerings that you're offering. Yeah, well, I mean, this conversation, you, you um, generously agreed to release this um, this conversation as a Creative Commons uh, open mm -hmm. free culture of work. So, so mm -hmm. that's really interesting to me because that mm -hmm. means you're going to publish it probably on your YouTube channel. And that means I could publish it also uh, through anything else that I want to. And anyone could publish this. They could take some part of it and they could share it. They could take the whole thing and include it in their course on evolving Dharma and charge a million dollars for it, whatever they want to do. Like, <laughs> <laughs> if you do that, feel free to, to give back to Tasha and I. Give back. The... Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, to me, that this is a good example, this conversation. Um, and, and I do all of my podcast conversations that way. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, social meditation, which is a, is a form of interpersonal meditation that I learned from one of my close teachers and friends, Kenneth Folk. Um, we took his work and built upon it. And he, he, he gets the open source thing and the generosity piece. And so he's been kind enough to really offer his unique innovations of taking traditional practices that were usually done silently by oneself and, and figuring out that you can do them out loud with other people and figuring out how to do that. Um, he, he has been really generous in letting us take that and run with it. And so we've been working on over the last 10 years, developing these interpersonal um, protocols for practicing together, for facilitating these um, intersubjective meditation experiences. And I know you have a background in that, in those kind of practices as well. So mm -hmm. I don't have to you know, explain to you how awesome they are and how beneficial mm -hmm. it is to bring meditation into the intersubjective space. Um, but we offer them as open source instructions. So that means that anyone can take them and use them. We do offer trainings as well for facilitators who want to learn from us and with us how to do that. But it's not a certification process. It's not like you have to do this training before you can then offer these things. It's instead, it's like if you want to get better trained and be able to better offer these things, you're welcome to, and, and here's where you can do it. Um, so 
what that's enabled already in the last year uh, of doing this, I've trained 100 facilitators in this practice over the last year, all open source, is it's, I think it's enabled to spread faster and further than it would have had I, you know, charged whatever, a few thousand bucks for the, for the training, which I could have, mm -hmm. you know, because it's mm -hmm. awesome tech. Um, mm -hmm. And people do charge that much for, for things like this. Um, but instead, it's like, you know, a 10 week course is like suggested donation $300. And, you know, and, and here's how you do the basic facilitation. And um, in one of those trainings recently, um, a woman named Vita Perez, who I knew back from my Boulder days, used to run the prison Dharma network, uh, is now running the prison mindfulness institute, has now brought these practices and techniques into hundreds of prisons, you know, wow. in, 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 wow. in North America, because they already had this network and they then they like social meditation and she's like asking me like so i could just like do this you like i don't have to pay you anything <laughs> and i was like no you don't you can just do it it's okay and uh -huh. um yeah and i i think part of the reason that that was able to happen is because of the open source uh nature of it so um mm -hmm. so already i have some some good data points on on how it's working and i'm pretty i would never i would never myself be able to do that like it's not my you know, it's not my mission in life to go teach this stuff in prisons. All that I'm so happy that that's being done. Um, mm -hmm. And likewise, for all the other people that are, you know, learning this stuff and find it valuable and then are bringing it back and adapting it to whatever context they're in, they can do that freely. You know, they, they don't have to jump through any hoops. Um, but they do, need to, they, do, they do need to say where it came from. And, 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 and that itself, from a business perspective, brings people back into our orbit. Uh, and so in a way that's, you could say traditional language that's marketing, but from another perspective, it's just like honoring where things came from. People get interested and want to go back to the source and learn more. Um, so, so I'm fine with that. Hmm. Yeah. Part of, part of the reason I want to ask about this is like, I'd, I'd be curious to hear your sense of, um, uh, like how you as a person right now, given everything that you know, and all the practice that you've done and, the projects that you've had, how you sort of orient towards this moment in time and human history and civilization and what you see when you look around or you read about things or so on. And then where you're hoping to steer towards <laughs> with all of these practices and these offerings. Yeah. That's like an impossible question. But, impossible uh, <laughs> question. <sorry. laughs> no, it's giant. Yeah. It's just so giant. Um, giant. Yeah. What are, I mean, I, I can say some of the salient things um, mm -hmm. that I see right now. Um, I mean, one is around the internet um, for sure. And, and Buddhist Geeks is, was born of the internet. It's, 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 it's Dharma in the age of the network, you know, is one way of putting it. Um, and so I see us as a human family really struggling to figure out how to, how to, how to harness the power of, of these networks for our deepest values, how to, how to actually be a world centric family and how to honor the substrate that is making all of this abstract digital stuff even possible, like the earth itself. You know, I see us really, there's, there's a huge disconnect uh, going on there. And then there's just this sort of hyper polarization of these little kind of groups and clans who are sort of ideologically at war, you know, in the U S right now, of course, we've got the culture wars and, um, you know, and those are taking place on the front lines of Twitter and, you know, and, and through all kinds of digital media. And, um, and we've got the ecological crisis, um, you know, right now where our ecological systems seem to be uns unspindling and, and, and to some degree falling apart, but, but like exponentially quickly, um, we've got the democracy crisis, you know, where democracies across the world right now are starting to shake and, uh, in some cases start to fail and authoritarianism is starting to kind of rise up, um, on the world stage. And, um, you know, we've got this incredible health crisis in the United States, mental health on the, on the back of the pandemic, it's even worse, um, the number of overdoses, the amount of suicides and depression, um, 
you know, it's like we have everything we need from a material perspective, sort of, not everyone has everything we need, but, you know, we're the, we're the, one of the wealthiest groups of people in history. And yet we're so fucking like unhappy and struggling. And many people are even struggling materially despite the incredible amount of wealth. So there's this inequality crisis. Um, and yeah, I mean, I just look at all of that. I'm like, whoa, holy shit. Like there is some serious, serious problems right now that we face. And traditional Dharma, the way it was formulated in the time of the Buddha, just isn't equipped to deal with that. Like it's it's got some good stuff. Like I think it can help people be, it can help people find a kind of freedom and liberation from the conditional realm, which is kind of increasingly in some ways hellish. Um, and which is great. Um, but, but that's by itself a kind of just spiritual escapism, you know, for people to just kind of hide in, in, in emptiness, use the Bruce term to hide in Nirvana, you know, out of samsara into Nirvana. Um, for me, the, the Dharma has always been a response to the conditions of the time. It is itself evolution. It's a, it's evolution. It's, it's, it's evolving. It's truth. But truth isn't static. It, it keeps changing. Or as Ken Wilber, my, my early mentor, said, he said, form is emptiness. Emptiness is evolving. Because the world of form is evolving and changing. That's our best understanding of it, our best story of it right now. Um, and so, too, do the, the forms of Dharma need to evolve and change and adapt to this moment. So um, when I look at the, this current moment, it's clear to me the problems and somewhat some of the solutions, like some of the things I've laid out, like social meditation, transparent generosity, some of these things I think could be part of the larger solution set, but not by themselves. Like it's not enough. There has to be something much broader, like a broader kind of collective uh, awakening, collectively seeing deeper into who we really are and what we really value um, and, and, and enacting that, in ways that are truly transformative, like before the substrate fails, before our ecology can't support us, we need to transform and quickly, you know? And so to me, that's why I emphasize the evolutionary part of like rapid adaptation, recombination, pulling out everything that can stop us from innovating and stop us from being able to collectively figure out the solutions to these problems no matter what, at every level that they're happening simultaneously, because anything less than that is going to lead to the complete cessation of our current civilization. And that to me is pretty damn important. Um, and I think anyone who's gone deep in their practice, you know, beyond the self-centered focus of realizing like I'm not apart from anything else, um, you know, starts to feel this on a really tangible level. Like, like this is so important. Um, like it's, it's nothing less than life and death and it's nothing more than, than death, <laughs> which is the other side. You know, it's like, we don't have to take it that seriously because it's just like, we're going to die anyway. Right. <laughs> so, you know, if everyone dies, okay, that's what happens uh, in this, in this part of the multiverse, you know, everyone, everyone we, we, we extinguish out into Nirvana, but I don't want that to happen. I care. You know, I care. I, you care. I, I know a lot of people care. And, um, and so, yeah, we got to we got to figure out how to translate that caring into action, and um, that's I think that's what we're doing together on the internet, um, trying to figure that out. And you know, poorly at times. I think on Twitter it's very challenging, um, and I don't think a lot of that is the fault of ourselves. I think it's it's also the way these platforms are built. You know, it's again the dharma of organization, of, of structure, of platforms. Like we need to bring these wisdom into the technologies we build. Um, more than anything, because they mm -hmm. they animate everything uh, that we do into the systems that we are embedded in, into the cultures that we swim in. And um, yeah, I I'm down for the challenge. I know you are. Mm -hmm. I hope mm -hmm. everyone listening is. <laughs> Me too. Uh, I obviously no one has a full picture to this because we haven't sort of cracked this nut yet, but. Um, you talked about how like the different things that you're offering through Buddhist geeks are, are sort of a part of the solution, but not, not the whole solution. Um, right. Of course. And what, what else do you see that you can, that you do currently know about 
uh, as being part of that solution. Uh, obviously, some of it's unknown and mysterious and emergent and to be determined. But uh, mm -hmm. what what else do you see kind of outside of the field of Dharma as being a part of us fumbling our way in that direction? Yeah, I mean, again, from a limited perspective, like of not seeing the whole picture mm -hmm. and, and having plenty of blind spots, I you know, I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm very familiar with the tech space. So I see, you know, what's happening right now in the transition from fossil fuel to renewable energy infrastructure. This is, seems really important. Um, and I see companies again in the for-profit space like Tesla who are kind of taking the lead there. And, and I don't know if we'd be where we are right now without that, without some of that sort of hyper entrepreneurial machismo of people like Elon mm -hmm. Musk. Um, who who actually had have a vision for that have have actualized it, um, so I see that as being really important. Um, and then you know, there's the consciousness side, which which I think is more where Buddhist geeks is operating, and where where, where your work probably um, dovetails. Um, and and to me, I go back again to Ken Wilber's work. I think one of the main missing models that we have right now to interpret and understand complexity of our current moment is human development is adult human development like that everyone is does not have the same set of capacities or capabilities in terms of their meaning making in terms of their emotional intelligence in terms of their social intelligence in terms of their you know all these different forms of intelligence that humans have which are not always at the same place you know some people are unevenly developed um and we're and we change you know based on on our mood it's not like these things are static either but um but i think the conversation about development needs to occur because so many of the problems we're facing are developed are people at different fundamentally different stages of development talking past each other like i think a lot of the culture war and the polarization is people just like with fundamentally different understandings of the world who cannot see eye to eye or cannot recognize that they're not seeing eye to eye um and so um to me, the, what Wilbur pointed to with, with the whole notion of integral consciousness is this capacity to be able to move in and out of different um, models of making sense of the world, like different ways of seeing, uh, and to be able to actually understand and appreciate um, how someone is seeing the world, even if you don't ag completely agree with the way of seeing, even if you see that there's such stuff they don't see. Um, you can still appreciate the truth that's there and to be able to begin to actually bridge the, the ideological chasm or gap between you. Um, he called these people, uh, based on the work of Don Beck and Spiral Dynamics, spiral wizards, because they can kind of they can kind of move in and out of these different stages, which they you know theorize as a kind of spiral. Um, uh, I have other friends that call this mimetic mediation, you know, that the ability to like mediate across these different memes these different ways of looking these different value structures um mm -hmm. i think that's really important and, and it's just not being it's being talked about in some corners of the internet but it's not part of the the larger dialogue yet uh, in part because bringing up the notion of hierarchy is kind of uncouth in a lot of spaces right now but i think the people that are critical of that don't sort of realize how much educational um capacity they've developed and how much complexity in their own view they've developed to be able to even critique hierarchies. Um, mm -hmm. And so they don't often see that that is itself a stage of development and that not everyone is there yet. And we can't get pissed at everyone for not being there yet. Um, we actually have to treat them with a little bit more compassion and kindness and look at how to change the environment that people are being educated in. Um, so like people like Zach Stein, um, and his work, Education at Time Between Worlds. Like I think he's doing some really interesting work because he's looking at how to change the educational paradigm, which to me seems to be at the root of so much of our problems right now. It's just a mm -hmm. lack of, uh, of depth of education. So um, those are some of the things I see, you know, the, technolo the technological, the consciousness in terms of uh, especially development, um, and then I think something about governance, which I learned a lot from Holacracy about, it's like, how do we actually govern ourselves? You know, if we're self-governing, which is what democracy claims to be, 
you know, clearly there's something that's not working with our current form of this American democracy. And I'd say probably more broadly, mm-hmm. like all forms of democracy are, are finding challenges right now. Um, and so it's like, yeah, how do we better self-govern ourselves, especially given that now we have these interesting technologies like these crypto platforms, which actually could enable people to program their own little 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 places where they could test out different ways of um, different rules for how money works and different rules for how the network their networks are governed you know to me that's actually pretty exciting that these that these things are starting to catch catch on even though it's mostly just been speculative capitalist asset stuff it's mostly that's how it's been treated but there, to me there's a kernel of potential in that what's sometimes called web 3.0 where you know you can imagine communities of people gathering together transnationally beyond where they geographically live to form different kinds of networks which overlay their current you know geographical networks or their family networks or whatever other networks they're in and they can experiment like what if i like put half of my assets you know into this particular network and we govern it this way and we do this and we experiment again to me it's evolution we could actually try these different things. Some of them might actually turn out to be much more effective at dealing with the rapid change that we're going through as a species. And maybe they'd catch on. Uh, maybe we could have these transnational forms of coordination start to emerge and resource sharing across national boundaries. Because the nation state and capitalism, they, they come hand in hand. They go together. And there's something that's fundamentally failing about that You know, that's just mm-hmm. not working. So I'm, I'm sort of excited about the prospect of these technologies opening up a space for the people who kind of have the consciousness to get that, to start to try to like make some real, some real experimental leaps and try to create new kinds of cult, like cultures of, of, of wakefulness um, that, that mm. might actually be more responsive to, to the problems we face. Because that's the key part of Buddhist practice to me is responsivity. You know, it's like, what, what are the teachings of all the Buddhas throughout space and time? As one of the Zen koans goes, and it's mm-hmm. a, a, mm-hmm. an appropriate response, just like something that's appropriate to this moment. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, it's it's interesting that you touch on the cultural dimension because um, I think something that I've been wrestling with a lot myself is uh, mm, what what did I resonate with in the culture of Buddhism that I've been exposed to, and mm. what have I not resonated with. And I saw you, I think you had a tweet on this recently, actually, about like how you wanted, um, I'm, I'm not remembering it right now, but something about like an aspiration of what you wanted Buddhist culture to be more of and, and uh, like maybe more fun and, and lighthearted and playful. And um, that's something that I've, I've been really trying to embody myself. And yeah, uh, um, I've seen that, man. Yeah. I've enjoyed, yeah. I've enjoyed your playfulness. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and your dancing. My dancing. Yeah. Dancing is a big part of it. Um, but I, I'd be curious to hear from you, like what you think, uh, both uh, what what kind of culture is going to be needed, of, uh, both both from the Dharma side, right? Of like, what is a culture of Buddhism that's needed now, but also more broadly, you know, Buddhism just being one of many traditions. But what what kind of culture is going to thread the needle here through this moment of crisis? I mean, not that we know it yet. Again, there's a sort of like grasping motion that you and I are both doing of like, we need something, anything that will get us through this. And not that I expect you to have the answer, but what, what are you seeing right. or wanting or desiring or trying to create? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's kind of like what, what, what I'm trying to do and what we're trying to do with Buddhist geeks. And then I think there's a, like the zooming out even further, there's a bigger mm-hmm. picture that I would, I would point to. And again, I'm, I'm really influenced by Ken, Ken Wilber's work here. Uh, mm-hmm. He had a book called Integral Spirituality where he kind of talks about this idea. Again, I mentioned development. Uh, He talks about this idea of of the great traditions, the religious traditions. At their best, they could serve as a kind of conveyor belt for development. They could support people wherever they are at at kind of growing up. Mm -hmm. And, And I don't think mostly religious traditions do this. Mostly they often will actually stunt people's growth and development at a particular place. Um, which is real sad. And I, but I think most people know about it. They know what this looks like. They've seen it. Um, mm. But imagine a religious 
tradition where you could really see a pathway of development of growth, where you could start, say, in a very mythical place. Like you could start really believing things are black and white and believing in the sort of mythological truth of the Buddha's awakening or Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior or whatever it might be. You know, you could come in from that door, which from a developmental perspective is a natural stage of human development, something we have to go through. You can't just skip mm -hmm. over it. Um, even if you're, you have a mythological belief in, in like pluralism, you know, and you think it's the only possible truth that everyone, you know, voice needs to be heard. Like you could still believe that in a mythological way and be really ideological and fundamentalistic about it. And I think that's part of what we're seeing with the, in the culture wars is this woke fundamentalism on the left, you know, is kind of like really pissing people off <laughs> and, uh, you know. And, and so I can imagine, you know, a situation where you could go into that mythical space and, and it can be like explicit that they're trying to nudge you toward a more rational worldview, you know, trying to really like question some of the myths and, and, and start to look at it from a rational perspective to, to, to kind of take the authority of the other and start to own some of that authority for yourself um, and not see it all being displaced onto God or to the Buddha or to whoever, you know, the figure is often some dude that's dead in the case of most religious traditions. But in some cases, like in QAnon, it's like some dude that's alive, like Trump, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, mm -hmm. how could we take that and, and actually use it as a, as a gateway into the rational? How could you go then from rational individualism to pluralistic multiculturalism? And then from there, and this is where I think Buddhist geeks were trying to operate is the, it's kind of this rational to pluralistic to integral uh, stages of development. Like how do we, how do we actually honor and include the truths of that pluralistic development, like of recognizing the, the massive differentials and power relations that are at play and seeing the way that we're embedded in fundamentally inequitable systems, you know, racist systems and systems that perpetuate unequal outcomes in ways that are just clearly unjust and unfair um, that could be tweaked to be more fair to be more just, maybe they won't lead to perfectly equitable results, but they, they, but they, they, but we could take out all the, the bullshit from these systems that is just blind to its own biases and, and start to kind of tweak them so that they're a little bit more fair or a lot more fair. And, um, you know, and then how do we move from there to being able to not just, um, and this is for, for me, I think part of my edge as well, so it's a little way, in some ways, hard to talk about. But like, how do we move beyond the kind of what Ken Ken described this pluralistic phase as flatland? It's like because everything is kind of relative to everything else. You've broken down models. Like, there's no true grand narrative that can explain everything. At this phase of development, you get that. Like, you're not trying to build this perfect rational model to explain everything. You've kind of let go of that attempt and you realize oh like i'll never understand it all because it's too vast and i'm too limited <laughs> you know and even we together trying to figure this out will not figure it out together because we have as a collective we whoever the we is have our own hidden biases and and things we don't experience um and there's something we're missing but that leaves one i think in this sort of space of like well what do i do then you know, like, how do I, how do I actually take action in a way that's constructive or that could be building something if it's not building some perfect model? And I think, you know, to me, the question of an integral Dharma is how do we take the previous lessons and learnings from the previous iterations of Buddhist Dharma and apply them to the, what we've learned in culture and society up to this point, technology, culture, society, how do they all come together into a more appropriate expression of this this particular moment and what's needed here and now, um, and I think that includes things like social justice, but it also includes traditional awakening, and it includes supporting a, a kinds of environments where people are preserving old texts and old ways of doing things, of actually preserving monasticism in an, in a new way, like a neo monastic kind of uh, vision, and it includes. You know, includes hardcore individualist meditators going off and achieving incredible states of consciousness. It includes people coming together into collectives and meditating together and exploring their shadows and like trying to heal their wounds and traumas and doing intergenerational trauma work and really trying to shift culture out of this sort of constant cycle of oppressor and oppressed 
um, you know, it, it includes all of that. Um, and I think it includes also these stages of development, you know, of recognizing that like this is a journey that we're on. And there are these important milestones and places in which we, um, we start to, like we have a breakthrough, awaken to something new, and we see the world fundamentally different. And not everyone is there yet. Uh, and we haven't even learned all, often when we're there how to translate that into our lives. Like we haven't integrated mm-hmm. our deepest awakening. So there's, there's the work of integration, of bringing that back down uh, and in and through. Um, and so that's where we're, we're working, I think, is trying to support people in discovering a kind of integral dharma, an integral approach that honors and includes the pluralistic, that isn't reactive to it. Um, one thing I would cr- be critical of with, with Ken's work back in the days, I think he was very reactive toward this pluralistic uh, stage of development, which has now become such an important part of the cultural dialogue. Like it's, mm-hmm. and, and I think it's right, rightfully so. You know, we're, mm-hmm. we're, you know, we're white people. Most of us, I assume you and I are. I mean, I'm, I'm part Palestinian as well. So this is where I mm-hmm. have, a, I think, a deep appreciation for the pluralism. And, you know, it's like, but we're living on land that, that was taken. You know, we're living on land that was taken. I'm living in the former Cherokee nation. And, um, you know, and then we brought people over here to do our work for us in Southern, I'm living in the South. So I'm going to speak as a Southerner. Um, and, you know, we're living on top of the backs of other people and then wondering why are all these racial tensions happening? Why, why is it, why are people so upset that George Floyd was murdered? It's like, well, if you understand the history and you've gotten to the point where you can kind of get the bigger picture, which again, to me is a developmental achievement, then it becomes apparent and obvious, but not everyone gets that. My, you know, some of my neighbors don't get that. And some of the people in our community in, this, in the rural South, they don't understand that. And, and yet I still try to be kind and caring, and compassionate to them and speak their language, you know, because mm-hmm. like they actually matter, even though sometimes I'm getting pissed with them, you know? mm-hmm. um, they mm-hmm. really matter and we have to have them on board or at least, you know, find a way to include um, their way of living so that, so that they don't feel so threatened and need to like, you know, react by overthrowing democracy, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. to me, these are like, these are important challenges and questions um, that I think we have to figure out as practitioners how to bring these things into the into like the real world, you know, where it really makes a difference and it can respond to these issues and these problems. Hmm. How do you see uh, awakening fitting into all that, like classical awakening in this current moment in this transition? Yeah, I, I see it being liberated from the individual first, um, from the from the mythical and the rational individual. Uh, I see it being able to be interpreted and understood as a kind of move toward justice, toward, toward equity. Like that awakening requires that we restructure the formal conditions of the world to more, to more match the transcendent potential that we realize. Um, and I see it as very much as expanding from the personal to include the interpersonal which is why social meditation to me is so important because it gives people a practical way to, to realize that, to see it, um, to meditate out loud together and to realize your interconnection in a different new way. Um, and I think, yeah, it includes, uh, again, the systems. Awakening has to include a transformation of the very systems that we're all resting on and that are further impacting our earth you know the negative externalities of these systems are what have arguably led to the to the to the brink of ecological collapse so you know i think all of those things for me awakening has to include all of that in its formulation now and it can't leave anything out otherwise it threatens it becomes the enabler of the very conditions that are threatening the demise of our potential to realize awakening Um, so it's like, we have to, we can't cut the branch out from under ourselves. Uh, and like Mm. part of awakening is just realizing, oh, I should stop sawing off this branch (laughs) right now (laughs) and and then help other people stop sawing off their branches and figure out how to, you know, let, let the forest regrow and let the, let, you know, let ecology do what it does best and, you know, and and come into a right relationship with the, with the earth and with each other. Um, and then Mm -hmm. with whatever the hell is flying around in our skies right now. Um, that we mm-hmm. that you know that we don't know what they are, but which uh-huh. uh, 
pretty clearly seem to me to be non-human tech. So uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> join yeah, the, it's, it's time like, to join the Galactic Federation here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm so glad you mentioned that because um, I think that that is one of the hardest things to talk about. Like I, I have yet to have an in-person actual conversation with anyone about that. I've only talked to people on Twitter about it. And it's like, uh, yeah. I, th- I think a really good example of this, um, what you're talking about of like, developmental stages and cultural moment of people being in really different places and it's like how do we even talk about this thing that's like a there's a thing in the room (laughs) how do we talk about this yeah there's this thing uh, these things flying around buzzing around uh at like super speeds that that appear to be hundred to thousand year like beyond the technology that we currently possess and we're the most technologically sophisticated country in the world as far as we know uh-huh. So yeah, it's like how do we how do we come to terms with that? Like, what is that? Who are, who are they? Uh-huh. Um, right, <laughs> right. Uh, and what does it have to do with our current moment uh, and this crisis that we're in? Like, you know, it's to me, it's beyond uh, synchronistic that 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 this disclosure of UFO or UAP phenomena is happening at the same moment that we're almost crescendoing in these cri- in this crisis. Like, it can't be mm-hmm. just happenstance that that's that that's happening to me it's too it's mm, too I, I, it's too magical too connective i i totally agree uh and thank you for saying it uh, <laughs> uh i i part of me i would i would love to talk about ufos and i think that that i think that's going to take uh, that's, that's a bigger a topic while. to unfold yeah <laughs> that's a huge topic uh but maybe we could close it out by by talking about one one last thing uh which sure, is sure in, you know, before this, we scheduled this conversation, we were kind of talking about a few different uh, aspects of it. You know, you mentioned earlier about how we agreed to have a Creative Commons license on it and how, what that means for this conversation and the world as well. But something else that you mentioned is how you've sort of, um, uh, and if you don't mind me saying, like tired of uh, the interview format, which this has so far been in. And, and yeah. you know, uh, it's sort of a tired format and you prefer conversations and so on. And um, I'm really noticing from being here with you in this conversation that it's like, I want to have like, hmm, how to put it, I want to have like 10, 100, 1,000 conversations with you and people like you that are thinking about all of these things and digesting them. But there's also an aspect of like, there's just so much um, information and values and worldview to be digested, to even kind of have the conversations that I'd like to have, which would, sure. would take like many hours and days. And uh, so that this feels like so um, rich and potent and heavy and abundant right now, like interpersonally for me, where it's like, there's so much here. And right. the only way that I've been able to, uh, uh, you know, I'm kind of getting meta here, but the only way that I've been able to position myself to be making sense of these things is by kind of through this lens of uh, talking to people in an interview that have some piece of a bigger puzzle and, Mm -hmm. you know, getting some fraction of the clarity that they have about what they're seeing and what they have to offer the world. And then kind of uh, vectoring from that from multiple directions. Like if you look at the, the conversations that I've had so far on this podcast, like there's totally different people from totally different backgrounds. It's like, what is, what, what, what is, what's it in common here? I, I'm confused myself. Um, mm. But, you know, w- with that kind of surfaced in the conversation, what, what, uh, what's it like for you to hear all that? And, and uh, how do you relate to this moment, this conversation that you and I are having in terms of like sense making and relating and, 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 you know, exchanging whatever, whatever it is that we're doing here. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's interesting the way you're describing how you're approaching this project. Um, you know, your conversations and interviews sounds like in a way you're like curating, um, different, different kinds of, um, perspectives and offering that as one, like kind of part of one channel. Um, which I, mm-hmm. I I think is really cool. Um, and then, yeah, we, it seems like we've opened up now to a bit more of a conversation, um, a little bit mm-hmm. more back. And That's right. And so, you know, at one point, and this is another way that I would talk about the developmental stages again. Um, you know, one way of talking about it is like rational, pluralistic, and integral. 
Uh, another way would be saying modern, postmodern, metamodern. Um, same same thing, different different way of describing it. So at one point, I I, I shared this tweet: metamodern podcasters conduct interviews. I'm sorry, modern podcasters conduct interviews. Postmodern podcasters have conversations, and metamodern podcasters build relationships. Mm. Um, and I think that's how I see what we're doing here. Like it doesn't, I mean, inter- getting out the information, like you said, doesn't mean you're just modern. Um, like mm-hmm. because every stage of development transcends and includes the previous, it's not that like we leave behind who we previously were. So we have to still get out the information and get like the, you know, get all the terms and all the background and the history. So someone can kind of orient to what someone else is saying, where they're coming from. But then we can start to like drop the idea, right? The notion like, oh, well, I know everything and you don't, you know, you're the interviewer. Your whole purpose is just like to, to get people who know stuff to say stuff. It's like, no, you know a lot of stuff and you have a lot mm-hmm. of interesting things to offer and things that I don't know. So there's something mm-hmm. interesting in the back and forth, like a dialogue where we sort of let go of this idea that one of us is higher than the other in some ultimate way. Um, mm-hmm. And I see that very much as the postmodern kind of decentralizing and questioning old hierarchies and kind of flattening things a bit but then it's like okay over time if you and i keep talking you know keep engaging like on twitter and elsewhere we we build a relationship we build a rapport and we can start to say things to each other that wouldn't have been possible before and maybe we even get brave enough to say something like together with each other while it's being recorded like about ufos or something (laughs) (laughs) yeah (laughs) so like that's how i see it it's like we're building a relationship and that relationship having some of it shared in public is uh is in a way inviting other people into our relationship into relationship with Mm. with us um, Mm -hmm. in a way that maybe it's only been really possible on the internet to do that um, at this this scale Mm. Hmm. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, it it hits home, and um, I think it maybe clarifies to me what kind of relationship I'm hoping to build. Because I think I see, I'm, I'm reflecting on the question I asked you earlier of uh, what I'm seeing, what you were seeing, and what you were wanting. And you know, for me, I'm seeing in my own life, how powerful contemplative practices have been, how, how, how much of a use they've been to me. Um, you know, I still feel like just such an amateur at them, but even to the extent that I have developed them, it's been utterly transformative. Um, and at the same time, how, uh, mm, well, yeah. And then I see, I see us in this moment of crisis on so many aspects, social, you know, economic, environmental, and I want to do, my heart is just going out. I want to do something about that. And I want to make it so that um, somehow those can, you know, the, the, the practices and, and, and other things can resolve that problem. And uh, I want to have a culture that I live in that, that, that sort of bears fruit to the, the resolution of that kind of problem naturally. It's not, um, you know, like, I, I want to live in a culture where, like, I every day get to, like, play and and be in abundance and that is somehow the resolution to the problems that we've had um and i don't know how to get there myself i have pieces of the puzzle like Mm -hmm. i'm trying to offer like meta to the world and and these conversations Mm -hmm. and my blog posts and things like that but like it's just twitter presence exactly yeah yeah uh and it's just steps and like we have to do that together and so i want to build a relationship with you and with other people that i'm talking to where like together we're like dancing our way into a new culture that solves the problems and it's also like mm. delightful and and maybe even the way i i frame it is like a heavenly realm like i want to dance my way mm. into a heavenly realm you know mm. where instead of mm. going into a hell realm that's just collapsing the planet i want to be right in a heavenly realm. So that's, mm-hmm. that's how I see it, mm-hmm. make sense of it today right now in my own consciousness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nice. I like that. Mm-hmm. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much for your time, Vince. This has been just an absolutely delightful conversation. And I, you know, I really hope it does build, uh, you know, a relationship in the future, not, not just for us, but also for the people listening to this and for the larger world where we do start to, get our shit together and build something more, more beautiful for the planet. Yeah. Good out. Yeah.
Next. Okay. Good to talk to you. Mm-hmm.